Um, we have Mr. Bilpool out here with us. Uh, I'm sure all of you have already read his profile, so I'm not going to bore the entire thing for you. But as you know, he's a co-founder and managing partner of United Seed Fund. Uh, they are based in Bangalore and they are on a road show right now with six cities, Mumbai being one of them. And we are happy to host all of you here along with them. Uh, interesting topic, of course, uh, where we are talking about five ways to open the VC's wallet and three ways to shut it down. I think that's something very interesting for most entrepreneurs to understand. Um, a lot of their uh, investments is actually in the social entrepreneurship and impact space. But they are, I think, open to other uh, kind of verticals as well. So I'm not going to take much time. And uh, you know, we also want this session to be very interactive. A request is whenever you do ask a question, please give a brief introduction about yourself, what you do, and what space you are in. Uh, so that helps us to put things in perspective. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming this afternoon. I arrived at uh, 1.30 this morning from Seattle on my 16,000 mile commute. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I'm gonna do my best to keep all of you and myself awake through the presentation. Uh, so let me uh, start, I was not gonna mention that we're on a road show. And uh, this is in fact true, it was originally a uh, six city road show and now it's a nine city road show. And uh, the reason we're doing this is because we have found that uh, while we sit in Bangalore and we have money that we want to invest, uh, we need to go out and meet entrepreneurs where they live. Uh, entrepreneurs are a little bit too busy to make their way down our, our way. And so we're coming out and uh, seeking out the greatest entrepreneurs we can find around the country, uh, building relationships and hopefully finding uh, great companies to, uh, to invest in the future. Um, we've done uh, four of these so far. Um, I'm doing two more on this trip. My colleague Sri Krishna has done a couple others. My other colleague Dave has done a couple more, and we'll keep doing this as we go forward. It's been such a great experience for us to come around India and, and meet people. So um, if you want to learn more about our roadshow, or if you have friends in other cities and you want to send them uh, our way, please go to uh, the URL at the bottom there, goes up to bc slash roadshow. And uh, please do uh, point people to what we're doing because we, we'd love to, to meet people and, and connect. Uh, to begin, I'd like to just give you a little bit of a history about where uh, Unitas came from. Uh, Unitas means unite us, as in bring us together. And the organization was started uh, nearly 15 years ago, uh, focused on initially entirely in the area of microfinance. And uh, we originally started a nonprofit organization with the goal, a single minded goal, of unleashing market based forces to address issues of poverty. And microfinance is the area that we found to be most fruitful and most likely to achieve those goals initially. Um, and we did that very well um, in the early days uh, of Unitas as a nonprofit. We then found that we needed a financial uh, backed entity, a, a, a privately financed entity, not a, not a non-profit, but a for-profit entity, to invest in microfinance institutions. And uh, we created the United Equity Fund back in 2005. Uh, a number of uh, individual and family foundation investors came in, invested uh, quite a few million dollars in that fund. That fund then invested in promising microfinance organizations and made a lot of money for investors and made a lot of entrepreneurs very successful along the way. Uh, one of our more notable investments was SKS. Um, uh, we have quite a few others. We've had a very nice return from that fund um, over the years. We also created Southeast Asia's uh, largest boutique investment bank, focusing in the area of uh, social impact organizations called United's Capital. Uh, we've invested, we have placed over a billion dollars US in capital over the past few years. We created another fund called United's Impact, which is a slightly later stage investment vehicle investing throughout Southeast Asia on livelihoods companies. And the new, newest entity, which I co-founded here, called the United Seed Fund. Um, and I will tell you in some depth today about what we do. Uh, in terms of who we are, um, I'll, I'll start with myself. You probably saw my bio, so I won't belabor it. But the uh, uh, basic background is a, a tech industry veteran. Uh, did very, very well in the tech industry for many years. Also was an entrepreneur in the tech industry and uh, against sort of what I would have expected when I was in college, I ended up running a multi-billion dollar business uh, called Windows that you probably have heard of. 
Um, and, uh, and along the way, I really decided I wanted to get back to my entrepreneurial roots and uh, get involved in impact investing and ultimately in creating the financial entity called the United uh, Seed Fund, which is why I'm here today. Uh, my colleague, Sri Krishna Ramvirthi, who's uh, in the audience here, uh, has, also has roots in microfinance and entrepreneurship um, and has been intimately involved in running our Bangalore operations. Our colleague, Dave Richards, uh, is based back in Seattle, where I am, another tech industry veteran with uh, deep microfinance connections. And then we have two uh, venture partners, uh, who, one of whom has been with us since the beginning, Robbie Venkatesan. Uh, Ravi's uh, well known to many people in the business community throughout India. He was the chairman of Microsoft India. He's on the board of Infosys. He just joined the board of the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and uh, we're very pleased that just a couple weeks ago, and this has not been publicly announced yet, but will come out soon, uh, Srikant Iyer of uh, Pearson uh, India uh, has just joined us as a venture partner as well. He's a nationally known expert in the area of educational entrepreneurship. So together, we are the leadership team that's uh, entrusted with the investment money of our limited partners and with the hopes and aspirations of the entrepreneurs that we work with to try to help, uh, help build some great companies. We have a lot of uh, leadership investors, both domestically here in India as well as internationally. All of them have a common goal, which is saying how do we invest our money to make a difference and, uh, and make a good return at the same time. We believe that it takes more than venture capital to make an organization successful. We believe you also need venture capital. And for that reason, we have a group of 40 now uh, venture advisors. And these are people who have effectively said, I want to volunteer some of my time. Could be a couple of hours per month. Could be a couple of days uh, per month. Could be more. Uh, I want to volunteer time to help great entrepreneurs solve hard problems and do well. Um, so we have, uh, and we're in fact always interested in other venture advisors to join us. So if you're uh, in the area of giving back while you're doing your, your business or you'd like to help us out in some areas and you see some of our portfolio companies that interest you, please do get in touch with us and we could, uh, could have some opportunities for you there as well. We also have what we call our Catapult Partners, which is a group of service providers who have lined up to give uh, a, a good deal um, of, uh, of expertise at, at a reasonable, favorable price to our early stage entrepreneurs uh, as well. So that's really how we come together to pursue our investment strategy. Uh, there's no better way to describe what we do than to tell you about some of the entrepreneurs we've invested in. Uh, so let me start with uh, Umesh Malhotra, who is the founder and CEO of Hippocampus Learning Centers. Uh, Umesh was at uh, Infosys in the 90s, uh, did pretty well, went to a, uh, founded a startup uh, around 2000 at the beginning of the mobile revolution uh, in Bangalore, and uh, had an exit there a couple years later, and decided that he wanted to put his, his effort into addressing the education inequality in this country. Uh, many people <coughs> have this desire, but they will simply uh, make a donation to an NGO, uh, write a check over here, uh, spend some time over there. Umesh said, how do I combine my business acumen, my view of how do you scale and build businesses with my desire to give back and, uh, and make education better, particularly for young children uh, in rural areas. So he, he uh, experimented for a while, came up with this idea of hippocampus learning centers, which is a uh, early learning facility, uh, grade ages four, five, and six of the children that are involved, so before grade one. That means he's not in the regula regulated domain. Uh, it means that he can do a great job and not have the government help him out too much, um, which is a good thing given the poor state of, uh, of government uh, education in most of this country. Uh, when we invested in Umesh, he had only uh, about 200 kids uh, in his learning centers. He had not yet proven that his pedagogy worked, and uh, he was really struggling to get things going. Uh, we made a bet on him because we believed in him and his team. And this, at this time, uh, about two years later, he has 6,000 children that will be involved or enrolled in his program. This academic here, he operates in over 120 centers uh, in Karnataka and is making plans to uh, expand uh, nationally through franchising as well as directly uh, owned and operated centers um, as broadly as he can. He will be doubling in size for the foreseeable future and still barely scratching the surface of the opportunity of need of providing uh, a better education to children at a young age. Uh, on a completely different end of the spectrum in the area of livelihoods, um, we made an investment just a few months ago in a company called Mgadi. 
Um, we made this investment before Uber got as hot as it is today. Um, how many know how much money Uber raised money at recently? 17 billion stick in anybody's head? Um, unbelievable, right? So that's Uber operating at the high end of the market. Um, uh, internationally, uh, we're all, after only four years of uh, operations, they, they did a serious financing round at $17 billion pre-money. Um, well, uh, Mgadi is not $17 billion when we invested in them, but they were at uh, about uh, 1,500 drivers under contract. They were just getting going. They now have 4,000 drivers under contract. That's only 4% of the drivers in Bangalore. And they are helping connect those drivers up to increase their livelihood by giving them more rides, simply by putting an app in the consumer's hands and letting them call up a auto rig or schedule one when they need it, uh, get better quality, uh, better confidence that the, that the auto rig will take them where they want to go for a fair price and giving that auto rig driver um, some more income along the way. So we have high hopes for what they can do for both making, uh, making rides better for consumers and making income better for the uh, for the drivers. Now this is a photo you look at and you say, what does this have to do with uh, social impact? And because uh, what you see here is a pretty high-end looking retail experience. It's actually in the Phoenix Mall in Pune. There's one in uh, Bangalore as well. And this store, store called Caravan Crafts sells a, a luxury quality product um, at a um, not luxury price, but certainly a premium price. Um, but the products are all handmade. And uh, the CEO of uh, Caravan, who previously ran High Design, um, the CEO said, um, you know, I, I believe that the art of craft is getting lost in this country, but the art of craft is in fact fundamental to how so many people make their lives. Um, it's the second highest employer after agriculture in this country. So how do I help those uh, world craftspeople in particular update their skills and build products that match the uh, desires and aspirations of modern Indian consumers, uh, middle class and above. And so he set out a dual mission then. One is to provide that level of training and upskilling and connection of those craftspeople to the trends and desires of not only the Indian market but also the global markets. And then also to of course create a profitable retail business where he takes those products, brings it to market and sells them. And so that's what Caravan Craft is doing. Their um, uh, first store is uh, just about to break even well ahead of plan. The second store is moving along nicely. And uh, it's very exciting to see what they will do as they build these flagship stores around the country and ultimately internationally as well. Um, our most recent investment is um, a combination of healthcare and education. The two entrepreneurs that started this company called Address Health um, have deep training, they're doctors, um, they have deep training in the public health sector. And uh, they have been running programs in schools, in uh, affordable private schools, of which there are uh, huge numbers of, of children being educated today. And those schools did not have any uh, reasonable healthcare education. They didn't te teach kids about hygiene, about nutrition, uh, about basic preventative care, immunization, dental care, and so on. So they go into the schools and they've taught literally hundreds of thousands of children over the num last number of years uh, through these programs. And what they found in doing this was that their parents were coming to them saying, hey, I learned about this need. I need to get my kid uh, his eyes checked. I need to get his ears checked. I need to deal with immunization. I want to get some preventive de dental work done. Where do I go? Well, they're entrepreneurs. You face with a need, they see opportunity, they went and created clinics that operate in a hub and spoke model. The, the spokes are all the schools, the hub is a clinic, and they've built three clinics so far that can serve the needs of uh, tens of thousands of families in Bangalore, um, and they'll be continuing to expand that, and they drive the speed of adoption and profitability of those clinics by running these healthcare programs that educate the kids in schools. So that's just a taste of some of the companies we've invested in so far. Um, we're very proud of the portfolio of 13 that we have. They are in a number of different sectors, as you've seen, education, healthcare, livelihoods. We haven't talked about agriculture yet. We have one there. We'll be doing some more. Uh, we have the area of what we call technology for development, which is a very, very broad-based area. Um, and, uh, and all of these 
are areas where we see a tremendous opportunity as the uh, econ Indian economy continues to, to grow nicely and the uh, billion or so people that, that live in this low income sector um, become more and more active consumers. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about where we see some of the opportunities going forward. And um, this is a time to sort of warm up your hand in a minute, so I'll, I'll ask you for some, if you have thoughts and things that I've missed at the end of this one. Um, but let me uh, just touch base of, of a couple of the areas where we see the most exciting opportunities. We looked last year, Sri Krishna's team looked at 250 deals last year. We looked at 150 already in the first half of this year. And so out of all of that, we have uh, culled a couple of uh, opportunity areas and trends that we see that are, that are most exciting. In the area of education, uh, and I'll just touch on a couple of these, uh, I don't have time to do all of it, but the area of education, uh, the one that I think is simply the most exciting is what low-cost technology can do. In fact, that's how I got going after Microsoft, looking at education technology as a way to profoundly uh, improve education, do it in a scalable way, um, in a way that can help uh, middle and low-income people. And so with uh, low-cost smartphones uh, in, in, in India right now costing uh, three or four thousand rupees with tablets costing, uh, a good sized tablet costing under six thousand rupees. Um, there's now the ability to put technology in the hands of, of kids that simply was not possible before. Or use the technology to help teachers be better teachers. Um, there's lots of different ways to build applications and solutions um, around edge tech. Um, in the area of livelihoods, uh, the, um, the group called National Skills Development Corporation, you probably have heard of NSTC, has made an unbelievable commitment uh, to have upskilling run at scale. And when you combine mobile technology um, and the ability to reach through you know, inexpensive data services and devices, um, and combine that with pedagogy and other means of teaching, you can now actually do upskilling at scale, like what Caravan is doing is they help uh, thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of artisans learn how to build uh, products that are in fact attuned to the to the new market. Um, in the area of healthcare, um, an interesting thing: you know, telemedicine has been around for a long time, but it's been frankly uh, underrealized or unrealized opportunity. People have been talking about it for 20 years, but yet one of our new investments is effectively a telemedicine operation that uses a modern BPO approach to providing uh, or projecting the capability of ophthalmologists out into. Uh, semi-urban and, and rural areas. Uh, I think there's plenty more opportunities with low-cost devices coming along, um, and again, low-cost communications for uh, the, the modern uh, incarnations of telemedicine to happen and, uh, and happen at scale. In agriculture, it's well known that some 30% of food in this country is wasted before it even gets to the point of distribution. We've seen a number of companies that are looking at the supply chain, saying how do we uh, fix the various, and there's many, many problems with the supply chain in this country, and in many countries, but particularly in India, how can we address some areas in the supply chain, do some interventions to improve logistics, to improve the efficiency of supply chains, uh, cloud-based supply chain management, uh, distributed uh, cold chain facilities, things like that, can all make a big difference in agriculture. In the area of basic necessities, um, these are hard. A lot of people have been running at this for a while, but we have seen a, a good increase in the, in the investment in the venture capital space of people going into uh, both, both water and uh, distributed energy. And I think there's some exciting companies that are starting to reach some scale there already, and I think there's lots more possible through technological disruptions, whether it's lower cost photovoltaic, whether it's improvements to uh, off of the uh, ages old uh, reverse osmosis in the water space. There are a number of technologies coming along there they are going to make uh, both the energy and water more affordable and more effective uh, to reach the people at the point of need. Finally, in the area of, uh, again, our, our sort of grab bag sector of technology for development, um, we see marketplaces everywhere we look. I don't know what percent of our deals are, are marketplace oriented that we see coming through the pipeline, but it's a, it's a double digit percentage. Um, and there's just a tremendous number of opportunities to bring uh, mismatched uh, supply and demand uh, together, uh, create them uh, in, in a marketplace uh, that, that creates uh, money and value for everybody. Um, I'm quite bullish about Aadhaar. Um, I think that the opportunity of giving uh, identity that's uh, durable and, uh, and, and ubiquitous in this country is one that will set, set us apart. And so I, I think people that build on Aadhaar will do well. Um, and finally, the whole area of, of data 
Uh, you, you got you know, a billion people out there, which not much is known at the micro level. Lots is known at the macro level. But anybody that can build data as a service and, and activate that data for commerce, I think is going to do well. So uh, now is the first pause where I'll stop for a minute and see um, if there are any others that, now you might have some secrets you don't want to talk about in front of everybody else, but uh, are any, any broad categories or, or exciting opportunity space or, or, or disruptions that are on any of your horizon that, that we should know about? Yeah, okay, like good entrepreneurs, you're going to keep this in your back pocket. I understand. <laughs> All right, so we'll go forward. Maybe you would like yes. to share uh, ah. Government of India is planning to, you know, build in fiber optic cables across all the villages over the country. So, you know, every village across the country will have a Wi-Fi zone network built around. So, those Wi-Fi zones can be used for, you know, community uh, social services, Great. government uh, distribution of uh, yep. benefits, yep. and maybe education. Yeah, that, so that, that's a great point, and the key thing there is as soon as that uh, connectivity is more ubiquitous, then it's going to mean that anybody's got a service that talks to uh, the needs of those uh, at that endpoint is going to have a, a means of distribution. So, yeah, absolutely. Low yeah. cost housing at rural areas and uh, comfort rooms at rural areas. Ah. So, low, low cost housing and comfort rooms in rural areas, and that's going to be made possible by. Uh, innovative materials use as well as distribution of those materials to make it affordable and, uh, and, and worthwhile. Good. Any other comments? Yeah. You can look for some solar uh, equipment which can help out in transportation because when we, when we move down south, there's a lot of sunlight, like 320 days in a year. So, uh, going through an auto rickshaw which mm. is solar based. So, that kind of uh, trend is there and people are using it, but it's not at a scale. Yep. So I think I think sol solar photovoltaic has got a tremendous opportunity curve ahead of it. Um, we have a bit of an issue with it being flooded with uh, low cost, low quality Chinese uh, PV right now, uh, which has got a lot of uh, some benefits but a lot of issues. But I, I agree that smart entrepreneurs can figure out how to apply uh, solar well uh, in, in a variety of areas. That's good. Okay. Well, that was very helpful. Thank you. So just touching on how, how we um, invest uh, here at Seed Fund. Ah, thank you very much. Um, we um, start doing what we're doing right here, is go and find great entrepreneurs. Um, we look through a lot of different channels. Uh, on the road, being on the road is one of them. We have a very active web presence and uh, Twitter presence. And we work through a lot of uh, uh, other investors and, and lawyers and service providers of different kinds, but basically finding great entrepreneurs is job, job one for us. Um, the second one is the kind of investment we make. We are a seed investor, United Seed Fund, um, and that means that we our investment size anywhere from 50 lakhs at the smallest up to about one and a half crores. Um, we sometimes might be involved in a slightly larger round, could be a two crore round, uh, maybe somebody comes in with some of that. Um, but that's the back, max size we do. So our sweet spot is in that seed level of investment. And, um, and our goal then is to work with that entrepreneur for typically about 18 months to move from taking that seed investment, let's, let's call it uh, you know, one, one and a half lakhs from us, um, and then uh, go into a, I'm sorry, one and a half cores from us, and then get uh, roughly uh, 10 times that in a Series A scale-up investment. Uh, so that's our specialty then is to understand how to get that entrepreneur from that seed level up to the scale-up uh, Series A level. We're actually in the process of doing that with two of our companies right now. Two others have already uh, achieved their, their uh, scale-up investments, both Hippocampus and Milop uh, in our portfolio. Uh, Hippocampus just raised Series B. Uh, Milop did Series A about six months ago. Uh, but that's really what our specialty is, to make the seed investment and then help them scale up. And ultimately, we look for a, an exit in somewhere from four to six years. Um, and for us, an exit can come in one of three ways. The, uh, the most sought after way for everybody is an IPO. I think that's something that uh, every entrepreneur dreams of. Um, most will not achieve, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the few that will achieve that will certainly uh, do very well. Um, the second uh, most likely, or maybe more likely than an IPO, 
is a secondary sale. So there's a tremendous amount of private equity capital in the scale up area of the market. Uh, private inv equity investors would like to come in and um, maybe buy a larger share of an operating company or buy a number of companies and combine them in order to have a nationwide footprint. So secondary sales provide a good form of liquidity, uh, both for entrepreneurs and for us as, as investors. And then finally, uh, M&A. Uh, India's traditionally been pretty weak in the M&A markets. Um, I think that's going to pick up over the coming years, again, as the companies that are <coughs> fighting it out at the top of the market, which is arguably the world's most competitive market, um, as they look to expand and look for uh, maybe a little easier going, one place to do it is to look down the market um, at previously underserved populations and companies that are serving them. Uh, okay, looks like I have a power problem here. Excuse me a minute. So that's, uh, that's our investment approach. Um, I, I mentioned about how we sit here in the, the seed sector of the market. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why we do this. Um, first is that you start on the bootstrapping side. Well, let, let me do a show of hands. How many of you are actively involved in entrepreneurial activity right now? Okay, that is great. And how many of you have received capital from anything, from any institutional investor? Right, okay. So that means that all the rest of you who did not raise your hand have either used your own funds, friends and family money, um, or maybe some, uh, you know, in, in, uh, some uh, angel money to get going. That's the bootstrap capital. And by the fact that you all raised your hands like that and you're all sitting here, says that this area of bootstrapping is alive and well. Um, and that's true in the United States, it's true around India. There's plenty of capital uh, for bootstrapping and getting people started. Never as much as you need, that's life as an entrepreneur, but the capital is there. If you go to the right side of the slide, the scale-up area, there also is lots of capital. There's quite a few venture firms operating specifically in the area of impact investing and even more in tech, and they're looking for series A rounds of anywhere from you know, five to 10 crores. That's where they tend to, tend, tend to be investing. They, they, they're, they're larger scale investors in established companies. But it's that place right in the middle here, um, the, the seed sp space that is commonly called the seed gap, the pioneer gap, or the valley of death. You all have probably heard these terms. You probably have felt some of that yourself. Um, I've been there myself as well. And that's really what we as a firm look to do, is to try to help address that shortage of capital there and to help the best entrepreneurs get funded so they can then move on to the scale up. Um, and still plenty of difficult work to do, but at least have, have enough money to fund it uh, through the, the larger uh, funding sources that are available. So that's where we invest in the market. Excuse yes? I have this question. Uh, what are the parameters that seed funds look for uh, funding any kind of funds? Um, what is the idea? You, you will hear a whole bunch of that in the next couple of slides. So, <laughs> good question. That, that's why we're here. And, um, okay. Um, uh, before I go into answering that question, I just wanted to briefly touch um, on uh, a little bit more about one other sector that we're very involved in, which I mentioned already is education. And um, we particularly, and, and tonight is the first night we were talking about this. So I'm, very pleased to share this with you guys all first, um, is that we have announced and are announcing a new <coughs> education initiative um, for this year. And uh, the, our particular belief is that if you look at banking and financial services, where that's been over the last decade, serving microfinance, non-bank financial institutions, and so on, that's been a huge growth sector nationwide. And our view is that education is going to have equivalent growth over the next decade. And it simply has to. The demand is there, the, the capability is there, the entrepreneurs are there, the willingness to pay is there, all the right things are lined up. And frankly, the failure of the government persists. Um, so the trend towards private education has continued to ramp up. You can talk about 30 to 50% of children in many areas are in private education now instead of in public education, simply being responsive to the fact that parents are not accepting the poor quality of education that's delivered by the public education system. 
And even if you go back to the example where I talked about hippocampus learning centers, those parents don't have a lot of money. They're living in agricultural areas, and they're paying between two and 300 rupees per month to put their child in that early learning facility, which is a stretch for them, but it's still worth it. And they could go down the street and get a free uh, early learning uh, program from the government with a free lunch, and they don't do that. Instead, they pay the two to 300 rupees and put them in the hippocampus program. That's just indicative of what we're seeing nationwide in terms of parents' desire to have their children have a better life and education being the ticket for it. For that reason, um, we just see this as a tremendous opportunity in growth space. So I mentioned a few minutes ago about Srikanth Iyer joining us um, just recently from Pearson. He's got tremendous access to uh, the so education uh, entrepreneurial circuits from his work at Pearson over the last number of years. And uh, we're very, very pleased to be allocating at least three crores to invest in the education sector over the next few months when we find the right entrepreneurs. So if you happen to be an education entrepreneur and have a scalable idea, um, we're gonna have a good conversation today because we're, 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 uh, we're ready to go and make some more investments in this space. So that's education. Um, now, you just asked me uh, a nice leading question to uh, what, what we look for. So I'm gonna talk about my uh, few thoughts on five things that really get uh, a, an, a, a venture capitalist like myself excited. And then I'll talk about a few things that don't. And I'm gonna give examples of each of them and I'm gonna show you some videos and let you watch and, uh, and draw your own conclusions about uh, how some different people uh, either do or do not uh, light up a VC's wallet. So let's start with uh, one of the things that I think is most fundamental. Is can an entrepreneur succinctly say what they're doing? And it is amazing how few cannot. Uh, I'm sorry, how few can. Um, it, it is amazing how many people you say, hey, what do you do? They will give you an entire elevator worth of just trying to spit out what they do, right? Um, they should be able to say what you do very quickly. And that's what draws you in. So being able to succinctly and articulate, articulate what you do is vital. The next thing we look for is, is a good sized market. Um, now there's lots of entrepreneurs, tens of thousands in this country operating, building perfectly good businesses. But they're not necessarily the kind of businesses that we're going to invest in or any venture capitalist can invest in because it's not a market that is big enough or that has enough opportunity for disruption to create a, a very large company. And so we are, we are very focused on scale. That means for, for the scale to be possible, the entrepreneur has to be good and the, the market in which they're operating has to be big enough for that scale to happen. The next one is a clear business model, knowing how do you make money. Um, again, seems like a simple concept, the level of convolution of answers you get here is, is significant. And a, a, a well-practiced uh, entrepreneur knows that simplicity is the way you get, get something done. It's simplicity and focus, and there's no place more important than in how you earn money from your customers or from whoever it is that's paying you. Number four, um, again, this is the, the world's most competitive market here in India in many areas. So if we look at a business and see a very clear long-term defensible play, we're pretty excited about that. If we see a business that's going to grow down to go down to a you know a race to the bottom in margins uh, within six months or a year, we're not so excited about that. So we look for a business that's got a defensible position um, that's going to establish a good market position that will be durable um, and defensible over time. And I'm not saying it has to be without competition. Of course, there will always be competition. But we want to make sure there's a good edge, there's secret sauce, there's something that's going to keep you ahead of the competition for a good long while. The fifth and not at all last point is seeing delighted customers. If you are innovating in your garage, in your dorm room, in your um, whatever, and building cool stuff, but you're not getting that in front of customers, it's gonna be pretty hard to get somebody who's a venture investor excited about what you're doing. If you, on the other hand, have built your MVP quickly, have put it in front of a bunch of different customers, have learned, 
because these customers loved it and these didn't like it, and these were kind of, eh, not sure, and you and you therefore you know changed and made your product better based on customer feedback. That's something that venture capitalists get excited about. Customers talk. We all like to think we know what customers want, but the smartest of us know that actually seeing customers voting with their wallets is in fact what matters. So customer traction is, is vital for getting a, a venture capitalist excited. So those are our five big things that open up our wallet that gets a, get us wanting to invest. So a few things that um, will turn off any VC pretty quickly. Uh, the first one is really a business plan that's um, unrealistic or just too complicated. Now, the things in quotes here are actual examples, I'm going to tell you. Um, one of them was a, a early stage entrepreneur who's built three independent companies, each doing different things, that are all cross-linked. Had a very complex plan for it, which took him 15 minutes just to describe the, how the arrows work on the, on the boxes uh, on, on, the, on the plan. This entrepreneur has actually been successful, to my astonishment. Um, and so somehow he was able to cut through his complexity and, and simplify it as he went forward. But it's something that it turned us off so that we could not make an investment early on in that business. Um, another one is just being unrealistic. You know, saying, I'm going to go from nowhere to having a thousand employees next year. Well, that doesn't show your you know, reality-based thinking on the part of an entrepreneur. Now, we invest, I've mentioned the word entrepreneurs all the time, we invest in people, we invest in teams. Right? We don't invest in markets, we don't really invest, I mean, markets are important, but we don't invest in a market first, we don't even invest in a business first, we invest in a person first. We invest in the team around that person. So, we had somebody come to us recently say, well, you know, our chief scientist here has invented this amazing stuff, um, well, he, he's got a good deal at, at IIT, he's going to stay there. But these undergrads are going to come and run the company. Yeah, okay, that, that's not going to go too far with a with PC. Um, this one is true. Somebody said the founder, 40% chance that he will join the company if we fund it. Well, there's a 0% chance we're going to fund that company. <laughs> okay? Um, uh, finally, um, this is probably the single biggest issue we have with dealing with entrepreneurs. And, and this is a, I, I've been on both sides of the table on this one, it's never an easy conversation, but an entrepreneur that is disproportionately focused on valuation versus the fundamentals of their business is not gonna get an investment from a venture capitalist. There are price insensitive angel investors, there are not price insensitive venture capitalists. Price insensitive angel investors say, hey, you know what, I really like you. We've been friends for a long time. I've made some money. I can write a you know, 10 lakh check to you and you know, whatever valuation you feel is fair, that's fine. Well, that might serve you well for the moment, but then when you go and sit down with a venture capitalist and say, hey, this guy's paid me all this at this valuation. I want you to give me the same, 10 times the amount of money at the same value, that VC is not likely to stand up and say, sure. So valuations are a problem. The other place where it's a problem, if, you sit, if you're building a business that is based on a let's say a 30 or 40 percent gross margin and you have a batchmate or a cousin or a neighbor who had a 60 or 70 percent gross margin SaaS business and you say okay well, I'd like to get the same value they are because I'm as smart as they are and I'm going to be a little further along than they are but the venture capitalist looks at it and says well, wait a minute but he's got twice the amount of gross margin his business is going to be able to grow without requirements for piles and piles of cash you, you're working on a 30, 40 percent gross margin, you're going to take a lot of capital. That means the returns are going to be less. It's going to be much harder to grow that business. So being realistic in your valuation in the context of what your margin structure looks like and what the realities of the market look like is key. And there's a, uh, we actually wrote a bit about this um, on our website. Uh, you could, if you go to valuation trap, uh, you'll see some analysis and some good data which might help you think about it. Never an easy conversation, but probably the biggest one where entrepreneurs trip up somewhere along the way. So um, with that, I'm gonna stop talking for a minute and show you a couple of videos. Uh, the first one is just kind of fun to get it going. And the next ones uh, will be videos taken of entrepreneurs that we like, that we've done some interviews with them about various topics. And there's some great examples of the things that 
um, I believe, help uh, help get uh, get venture capitalists excited and a few things that don't. So let me uh, take a minute. So actually, before I go to any questions on what I've just presented, before we go to videos, yeah. You have any benchmark in terms of financial parameter? Let's say revenue on the growth rate that you see. What venture before you look for? So your question is, is there a benchmark on what kind of financials we'd want to see prior to investment? Yeah, in terms of revenue, what you see on the, yeah. the growth rate. So um, the answer is there's no hard and fast benchmark. For us, um, it, it, given that we are investing post bootstrapping, uh, as a seed investor, our expectation is that you've received some rubies from somebody. Uh, hopefully a bunch of rubies from a bunch of somebody's. Right? But we're not expecting anybody to be anywhere remotely close to profitability. Um, we are not, ex we, we don't sort of have some litmus test of saying, hey, if you haven't, if you don't have, you know, a crore rupees in revenue, we don't invest. We look again, we focus on the entrepreneur first there and say, have they learned as they built the product, brought it to market and received those rupees from those customers? Do they have an idea of what their unit economics look like, what their business looks like? Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, have they taken some of the risk out of the business? That's really what's important to us. So they have to have gone far enough to have a business in revenue, um, and that's adequate for us. Now, as a Series A investor, I'd want to see a substantial you know, baseline amount of revenue coming in every year. I'd want to see a growth rate that's at a certain level. I'd want to see a lot more risk taken out of the business. But we're a, a risk-seeking investor at the seed stage. Um, so as long as there's a business that started an entrepreneur that knows what they're doing, we're open to a conversation. Hi, hi. Yeah. Hi, my name is Pankaj. I run a startup called Yantra Seva. Uh, you mentioned about a comparison between a SaaS kind of a startup where gross margins are around 60-70%. Yeah. Uh, compared to another startup which is around 30-40% gross margin. So, what is what is the United's uh, approach? Right? Are you open for that kind of a low? Now, 30-40 percent is a bit lower margin compared to a general VC investment yeah. or a tech startup yeah. kind of an investment. So, are you open for that kind of a margin? We, we actually are specifically open for looking at companies that have a lower margin structure than your traditional tech tech investment. And yes. So, and so. And so We'd be very happy to find a business that serves the bottom of the pyramid and makes 60, 70 percent gross margin, yeah. but I don't think you'll find too many of those. And, um, and a follow-up question is: uh, uh, You said about a long-term defensible market position. So, in, in current scenario where uh, people are putting billions of dollars in services like Uber, for example, uh, where does M Gadi kind of a, a venture stand up to that kind of a money which is coming from west or from anywhere? Sure. And really develop, develop a defensible. Right. So, your position is never going to be unassailable. There's no question. Um, I think uh, if if Angadi was focused on the top of the market, we certainly would not have invested. But they're actually doing the opposite. They're focused at the bottom of the market. So they're going where Uber is not doesn't need to go, and it is not in their business model to go. <laughs> The margin structure they have to operate on is very narrow, much less so than, than Uber. And the other particular defensible position they have, this comes back to my point that we invest in people. The two founders of Mgadi, one of them is a technical founder, and the other one is a labor organizer. Well, if you're gonna deal with five million auto drivers in this country and try to figure out how to get them to do something differently, I don't want just a, a good tech guy. I don't want just a consumer marketing guy, I want someone who knows how to deal with humans at scale that are unruly and challenging. So that's why we invested in that team. Uh, that is, in fact, what I believe is one of their long-term defensible positions. It's not only they're going after this area that nobody else is playing, or very few others, but they have some talent that is, creates a, a unique team, a unique combination that can go after it. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Sarvajit. I have a business in ethnic handcrafted truly. Uh, basically, my question is that when you create a business around livelihoods and stuff like that, because I have done that in the past, not with much success, uh, is is that you have to stick in for a reasonable amount of time, right? Because we, uh, I mean, we've had investments from VCs who wanted quick returns and wanted you know 20, 30 percent month growth month on month, right? And 
it, it, it ended up being like a video game, right? We were the player playing the game, the video VCs were driving us. Mm. So when you invest in businesses which have livelihoods where you have to build up infrastructure or you know, supply chain, like for example in the ethnic goods category, mm -hmm. I mean the, the artisans don't know what, what the colors are and they don't know how to you know package their products or how, how to put up you know some kind of a quality checking. If you invest in all that, it takes a long time for you to, for, for that to you know give you any returns. So I mean how how committed uh, would VCs be in investing in the long long sure. haul for the businesses that you run? So 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 to bring your question, you're basically saying, are we a patient investor? Um, because a lot of the tech investors, or even a lot of the angel investors, are looking for a three to five year um, exit completely. Um, some of them, more like two to four years. And the answer is, we are certainly more patient than most, but we cannot be infinitely patient because we have limited partners that we answer to as well. Um, so by nature of where we invest, we know that it will take longer for businesses to become successful and to scale. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at some of the businesses that we've picked, they're scaling very rapidly. Uh, so in, in just over two years, Hippocampus went from 200 children to, to 6,000, and they will double again next year is my guess. Um, we have another group, uh, iStar, another education company, again, they went from, from uh, under 100 to, to 5,000 um, students that, are, that they're serving in, in about 18 months. So um, we think that it is possible uh, to have livelihoods based and education and other deals in these sectors scale um, quite rapidly if you put the right team together and if you're focused on the right kind of a business. There are other ones that simply can't scale that rapidly. They're perfectly good businesses. They may just not be right businesses for venture capital. And I'll tell you, of the you know, 150 deals we've looked at this year, um, there's plenty of good businesses in there that we haven't invested in. And again, it's not because they're not good people or good businesses, it just doesn't fit our model correctly. And one of our goals and our, our commitments to the entrepreneurial community is we will try to say no as quickly as we can. Most, if we, if we don't have, if we can't say yes, we want to at least say no. We don't want to straighten people out, we don't waste people's time um, if, we, if we don't find the right fit. Okay, let's take one or two more questions and then I'll go to show you some video. Yeah. Yeah, so um, serving the bottom of the pyramid sector, for the most part, online doesn't work because they simply don't have access to the tech for online. Um, we believe that online can help in teacher training and it can be used as a, uh, to augment a classroom at the sort of top of the bottom, if you will. Um, but for the most part, um, from our investment uh, criteria, which is we look for scalable businesses serving bottom of pyramid populations, uh, online is not yet ready. I think in a couple of years from now, as again, cell phones and, and mobile uh, tablets continue to come down in price, it'll be closer. Um, but uh, but we have to look for businesses maybe blended between middle pyramid and bottom pyramid for, for online to, to work for us. Last question like in the back. To, I'd like to just add to that, maybe yeah. uh, you're not aware, but yeah. there is a startup, just this, this one, a okay. startup which is actually started training for two of the pyramid people, mm -hmm. uh, children, through online media. Okay. They, uh, I don't remember the name, I'm sorry, but what they do is like corporate people, They have they, we, we have uh, an hour of a break every day. So you can dedicate half an hour, one hour per day, sit on Skype and teach this bunch of 20, 30 uh, children sure. from uh, very low backups. So they, they have started this up. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, so I, I could be wrong. If there are applications of tech that actually is affordable at the bottom of the pyramid, I, we'd love to see it. I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the price. All right, so we're going to be we're going to have more time for Q and A at the end, but I got one more at the very back here. Considering uh, you're looking at ten x, can you hear me? Yeah. Considering you're looking at ten x in a time span of four to six years, what has been your strike rate? Likely. Yeah, right. Well, we're, 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 we're pretty early. We're only two years into it. So we've not had any exits yet. We've had one failure out of uh, 14. So we have 13 left. 
Uh, so I feel pretty good about our failure rate right now, and I had expected to have, had, and I had not expected to have any any wins yet. My our key internal metric is how many do we get to Series A, because ultimately for us as seed investors, um, if we don't get into Series A, they're not going to succeed. And we are we have two of our 13 to Series A, and two more on the way. So that that's I think probably the better measure of, uh, of success for us in the short term. Of course, sure. No, we're going to lose some and win some. That's 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 life. That's why that's why it's called a portfolio, right? Okay. So let me uh, let me do some a little bit of fun here now. Uh, how many of you have heard about a? Um, uh, a new show uh, on HBO Home Box Office called Silicon Valley. There's one, two. All right, so um, I won't tell you how it is that I got all this to rewatch on the airplane, but I watched a bunch of Silicon Valley. So, so what this is is a 30-minute uh, uh, program runs once every week or so, and it's meant to be sort of a reality of what it's like with a bunch of uh, tech entrepreneurs living in incubator in the heart of Silicon Valley. And I actually lived in the heart of Silicon Valley 20 years ago, and although I was not an incubator, but it's really quite funny to watch this. Um, uh, I, I mentioned that um, one of the things we look for is people that have realistic and well-articulated business proposals, if that's what gets them. VC is excited. So I'm going to show you an example from Silicon Valley and let you decide whether you want to invest in this company or not. Uh, excuse me. Audio? Yeah. Hello! I got seven words for you. But seriously, you know, a few days ago, when we were sitting down with Barack Obama, I, uh, I turned to these guys and said, okay, you know, we're making a lot of money. And yes, we're disrupting digital media. But most importantly, we're making the world a better place through constructing elegant hierarchies for maximum code reuse and extensibility. So what do you think? We're making the world a better place through maximum code reuse and extensibility. Huh? <laughs> okay, anyhow. Um, I, I'm not invested in that company, unless you are or not. Um, so now I'm going to show you, um, first, uh, we asked a bunch of entrepreneurs, how do you make money? This simple question, how do you make money? So, um, and once you sort of take note as we go through this, then we'll, we'll stop at the end of four entrepreneurs telling you how to make money. I'd like them to go around and uh, you guys tell me what you think about what you liked or maybe what could be better with a couple of these. So here we go. So we are professionalizing the care and home services. We charge clients um, on a daily and a monthly basis. Um, that's our main revenue model. We make money as we start. In the beginning, we own this start to finish. But as it goes to scale, we become two things. We become a marketing entity on the front end, selling branded products that represent the farmers. And on the back end, we're operating like a fund, bringing in investor capital and launching these processing rules. Well, we make money by charging an interest rate to the schools on the loans that's uh, lower than what they would be able to get in the informal market, more than they would get with banks, but the banks won't lend to them. And so that interest income is greater than our expenses. It's pretty simple. Uh, for our mobile clinics, we have a subscription-based model, so we uh, charge the annual subscription uh, to groups in tier 2, 3, and 4 areas that we provide with them. We make money from three sources. Students pay us for training. Entrepreneurs pay us to access training and mentoring and other networks. And corporates pay us to access entrepreneurs and talent in rural markets. So what do you think? Who, who, who wants to say somebody they liked about what, what, what was stated about how somebody makes money? Entrepreneurs one through five. Any, any comments on them? I, I think 
I think the one who came up with the interest model was pretty concise and clear. Yeah, he was very sharp. He was very sharp and gave a good sense of what he was doing. And it also gave a sense of positioning the product. Uh, not because he, he, con he contrasted yeah. what he does with what somebody yeah. else does. The yeah, 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 do it wasn't it. a flat, I make revenue from ABC. Yeah. Know, he also gave a why to it. Yeah, that's good. Other comments? Two yeah. very complex to understand. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, back end, front end, beginning end. Exactly. And, and, and complexity is the enemy of success. Right? I ran the <laughs> Windows business, I know. <laughs> Other comments? Things you liked or things you didn't like? I thought overall they're pretty good, weren't they? And these are people that we just sat down at, at Suncup um, a few months ago and put on camera and asked these questions. And um, most of them did it in one take. And, and I, I was really, I was, quite, I was quite impressed. And I think it's, uh, you know, for you to think about as, as you sit down with somebody and they ask you that simple question, how do you make money? There's some, there's some good, uh, good role models for you there. All right, let's look at another question. This question is gonna be, where do you see yourself in a year? In a year's time, so currently we are operating in Mumbai in a uh, very defined uh, area. In one year's time, we would like to see ourselves covering entire Mumbai. In a year, we will be serving 10,000 meals a day all over Gurgaon, having an outlet in every slum and every informal area there is. Uh, having around 10 vans on the road selling in industrial areas and some carts. Um, yes, that's where we will be near. Uh, an employer of 1,000 people, uh, making uh, a bottom line of almost uh, million to two million dollars. In a year, we would, uh, uh, would have at least uh, two states completely captured from the data and the various channels uh, and uh, at least 40 or more businesses that would have leveraged the value of this platform and scaled their own sales and distribution. In a year, I see ourselves being the rural gateway uh, for corporates wanting to get into rural markets and to impact and to bring about a whole lot of entrepreneurs and talent really looking at opportunities. Okay, what do you see that you like, what do you not like? Comments? Number five, vague. Number five is what? Vague. Vague. It was vague. It was not clear. Yeah. A little, a little bit lofty, huh? Yeah. yeah. First and fourth were very clear in terms of the goals. Yeah. Like one he said Mumbai and in terms of the definite number of support. Yeah. The, the higher, we're going to hire a thousand employees in a year. <laughs> that's it. That's a little improbable, yeah? <laughs> Maybe. I'd love it if he did, but it's going to be hard. If he's got other, your other, money, he can. What? I said if he's got your money, you can hire a thousand. Uh, I don't know. Even with my money, I don't know. <laughs> uh, other thoughts? The second entrepreneur was thinking a lot uh, at that time when he was not really confident, maybe not prepared enough uh, that, about his target because he was thinking a lot of, about the end. Mm. Yes, maybe, maybe he, he wasn't quite ready to answer he, the question. He, yes. Yeah. So the, the interesting thing here is, so now put yourself in the shoes of these entrepreneurs and uh, you just find yourself in the elevator with, with me or somebody like me um, and I ask you two simple questions. You say, you know, my name is whatever. I said, oh, but how do you make money? Can you answer that like that? I said, well, that's great. That's really interesting. So where do you think, what, what's your opportunity within a year from now? Where, where do you think you'll be? Well, by the time I get out of the elevator, you know, have, have I, am I excited? Or do I think that you're, um, maybe should go up and down the elevator for a while? <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, I think those are some uh, helpful examples for you. Um, and it's good to have you, uh, thinking about both the, the, the good um, as well as the things that they could do better. So I've got a few more things to share and then we'll go for some more Q&A.
so just to summarize sort of what those wallet openers and wallet closers were. Being an articulate entrepreneur, showing you've got a large market with opportunity for disruption, a clear and simple business model, we've heard some examples of that. A long-term defensible position, that's, that's a hard one to get across in a short conversation, but it's one you'd like to come through. Um, evidence of traction, we didn't see that here, but there's certainly uh, entrepreneurs that can offer that are very powerful. Things that get people to uh, clo close their wallet, uh, unrealistic plans, um, a team, again, that's not something that comes through in the elevator conversation, but is that team really there and valuation? So a few other things that we want to know. Uh, I mentioned that we focus on scale. We see a lot of really good businesses with fine entrepreneurs behind them, but they do not have aspiration for scale. And if I'm a venture investor, I have to be talking to somebody who's got aspiration for scale. So how are you going to get to a lot of customers? How are you going to get to 10 lakh customers? Right? If you don't have a vision, you may not know exactly how you're going to do it, but you need to have a vision for that. You've got to have an aspiration for it. You've got to have a, a plausible plan for how you're going to get to some kind of scale. We also were a, a risk-seeking seed investor. We know that people will make mistakes. We make them ourselves every day. We have made them ourselves in our startups and the people around us. We've seen plenty of that. What we look for is people who learn. Because if you learn from your mistakes, then you're going to do better next time. So if you say, hey, you know what? We started doing this, and we learned A and B, and therefore we're now doing C and D. And that's because we learned this the hard way. We move quickly. We incorporate those learnings into our new plan, and now we're going over here. Learning is a good thing. Entrepreneurs that show they learn is key. We look for people that have concrete plans for at least 12 months. I don't care about three years. I care nothing about five-year plans, but a solid 12-month plan that can then be extrapolated into a three-year plan is great, but a solid 12-month plan has got to be there. People need to be realistic about how much money it's going to take to actually get that plan done. Some people say, oh, I'm talking to venture capitalists, you're going to give me piles of money, life's going to be easy. Salaries go up, facilities get better, cars get nicer. Not the case. Not, not, from our, not with our money. So we look for really frugal entrepreneurs that are clear on the minimum amount of money that they need to get, take from us or anybody else in order to achieve their objectives. That's the way that you maintain the most equity in your company, and we retain confidence that you're going to be incented to go to the long haul and win. A final huge mistake people have is around not understanding their unit economics. And if you don't know what those words mean, I don't have time to go through them in detail here, but go and Google it and think about it. But knowing how for every unit of product or service you sell, how much money you make and what does it cost you to deliver that unit of product or service. And truly separating that out from your corporate overhead, from your R&D and everything else, understanding unit economics is vital, particularly for the kind of businesses that we invest in. And finally, we're talking about impacts here. If you're going to tell me you've got a 30% gross margin business that doesn't have any social impact, I'm really uninterested. If you tell me I've got a 30 to 40% so gross margin business that's got really fantastic social impact, I'm pretty excited. Tell me you've got a 60% margin business with social impact, I'm really excited. Okay? But understanding what your social impact is um, for an investment in my sector is, is vital. So I'm going to end the presentation with um, some inspiring advice that came from some of the same entrepreneurs uh, that we uh, talked to at Suncop, and I think you'll enjoy this. I think the single biggest advice I will give to any entrepreneur is to just do it. Don't keep thinking about it. Don't keep thinking on your couch. Take action and just do it. Risk is overrated. Till you actually go down and start doing it, you know, you'd never know how things turn out. Just hang on and there, perseverance, so never give up. And two, keep thinking creatively, uh, because the challenges we're trying to solve are not smaller ones. Never eat lunch alone. Network, network, network. And really ask yourself, are you adding value to your customer? So therefore, do you understand your customer and its needs? My uh, experience has been that, uh, however good your social code is, uh, make sure 
uh, your financially really really viable and get it verified by at least three to four really good mentors. Make sure you have fun. Spend a lot of time uh, visiting your target market. Uh, understand the, uh, what their needs are, what are the alternatives they use, uh, how would you deliver your services, their affordability, how would they finance it. You obviously don't want to make mistakes, but you cannot be soft-skinned uh, about mistakes. You need to be able to survive and grow a thick skin and, and be confident about what you're doing. Don't take no for an answer. Don't do it until you yourself are thoroughly convinced that this is what you want to do. And once you start it, stick to it. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise because it's the power of your idea and what matters is how you envision on executing it. Okay, so with that, I think we can open it up to a few more questions. Okay, I have a question. So, so just in case I get in touch with us, please follow us on Twitter. I'm W. Poulet on Twitter. <laughs> Not as responsive as I should be, but you'll eventually catch me. Um, United Seed Fund India is our Facebook page. Please go like us. We post a lot of useful content up there. Um, and if you want to learn specifics about how we fund people, um, and a lot of the things you just saw us talk about today, usf.pc slash get funded. All right, question. Okay, uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Arvin, and I'm launching an online party marketplace. And uh, my question is on traction. So traction to your mind would be typically financial metrics. Would you also look at non-financial metrics? So in my case, uh, <coughs> suppose I showed you the merchants who ma managed to sign on board, their quality, etc. Would that be a traction metric? So, would you, would you, because your traction, yeah. you said very much is related to customer delight. Yes. In this case, I have two customers. Yeah, one yeah. Is supply side and one is okay. The so, so side. you bring up one of the most challenging aspects of a marketplace, and you, the question is, what do we look for for traction in a marketplace? Um, and and uh, and the answer is. We look for, it's never going to be balanced on both sides early on. There's always going to be, you're going to have one side of the marketplace more, go, more developed than the other. But if you are zero on one side and high on the other, or vice versa, you're not going to get anywhere. So we look for at least a little bit on, on the, particularly on the consumer side. The consumer side is the most expensive side of the marketplace to build. Um, the supply side is not that challenging in the grand scheme of things. So if you just come to me with a beautiful supply side marketplace but no consumer traction, I'm probably going to say, hey, go show me you got some consumer traction before we did that. That's what I need to see funding for. You need to have, I, I understand. So, um, but for, for our investment, our, our position, I could invest all day in one side of marketplaces no, that, no. that are missing the other side. I literally could do that all day. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I, I totally feel your pain, and I understand that that's probably the problem. Other questions? Yeah, I mean, I want to know besides the money part of things, you know, how do you add value to the entrepreneur's business? And how specifically do you add value in terms of experience that you've got and in terms of how you mentor the entrepreneur? That I think is one of the missing chains in India. The entrepreneurs are not really being mentored by VCs and, you know, and they're left on their own and they just have to come back for monthly presentations and that's not going to help them scale up their businesses. Yeah, so the question is how do we add value? Um, and the answer is um, we add as much as we are capable given our business model. Now, if what you need is heavy lifting value add, then we're not the right people to go to. What you need then is an incubator. And we actually have partners throughout the country who are running incubators that are all about day-to-day -day value add. We are we are week to week and month to month value add, not day to day. That's just the reality of who we are and the scale at which we invest. So we're going to have 30 portfolio companies managed by three investing professionals and a team of seven. Um, so we're going to take all the value that we have 
um, relative to strategic value, being like board members, helping you get Series A funding, we're going to be able to do that really well, hopefully better than anybody else. But if what you need is somebody to sit there and be your uh, you know, mentor or partner to work with you every day, um, we can't do that. And we'll be very straightforward with you that you're just too early. And we have a lot of entrepreneurs with categories as too early for us. And we then help connect them up with somebody who can offer that kind of value. In the back. Yes. Uh, sir, do you invest in just an idea with a well-rounded idea, no financials involved, only idea? No. <laughs> I told you we do quick no's. Um, I, so here, here, here's, here's I, I, I don't mean to be flip about it. The fact is that uh, ideas at some level are cheap. Even the best idea on the planet is easy to come up with Executing on that idea is what we have to invest in. So we invest in a person who's shown that they can execute on an idea to get it through to a point. Um, if you want a, simple, pure, a pure idea level investment, you're talking to a, angel, angel capital or your own capital, not us. So if uh, there's some kind of bootstrapping in it, and that idea is not executable, it's not like just an idea. I understand. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you really value at multiples at your stake, or it is more like a budget-driven approach? What it will take to reach to the next uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. Try it again. Uh, the question is: Do you really value co companies which approach you at some valuation multiple, or it is more like a budget-based approach? Ah. Where, how much it will take from this stage to the next stage? So the question is about how do we approach valuation and how do we look at the budget of what it costs to get from the current stage to the next stage? Um, that's a complicated topic to address. Um, I'd say that to answer the second question first, because that's easier, um, if we invest roughly one crore, then we're going to look for companies that can, with one crore, make enough progress, get enough further, further traction to be uh, prepared for a Series A 10 crore investment. So by definition, our sweet spot is those who can get from where they are to where they need to be for Series A with roughly the amount of money that we would invest plus whatever revenue they bring in along the way. That's the type of company that we invest in. Now there may be others who need less, maybe others who need more. Doesn't mean that they're right, they're better or worse. They're just different. The ones that we specialize in are ones that are in about that sweet spot. Um, in terms of how we discuss valuation with them, if you go to our uh, valuation track blog, you can read a bit about it. Um, in general, what we look to do is to own on the order of 25% of a company. That's that's sort of where we start. Um, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on risk, but that's that's the general range for our investment. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Sunit Shah. Uh, we basically into agri um, e-commerce space. Um, my question was, uh, so our requirement is a little bit on higher side, so if you find the business model like you know, justifiable and workable, is it is it uh, is it the possibility to you know co-fund it along with a different yeah, so, so, so your question is, I have a business that's got a higher capital requirements in agriculture that we see this fairly often. Um, and so how would we look at that situation? Um, there's two possibilities. One is that we'd say, hey, we really like this business and the entrepreneur that's running it. We understand it's a little bit more capital intensive than what we usually do. So maybe we'll find a syndicate. We'll find another investor, right. like-minded investor, or maybe the entrepreneur has a couple of angels who want to come along um, who bring capital, but not, uh, not intellectual capital, but, but financial capital can invest and get you the amount of money you need. Um, so that, that's possible. It's not our preferred model of investing, but we have done some deals in that space, and I, and I expect that we still will. Um, the key question, though, is how much capital do you need in the long term for the business? Um, if it's truly a capital-intensive business, that's just not our place. Uh, we, 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 I'm sorry? We need capital for two years. 
Yeah, so mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's a couple of years, then that, that works. Um, if it's just simply a business that eats capital, it needs to have access to debt or concessionary debt or government debt or whatever, then that's a place where we probably just simply don't play because we, we don't have that kind of capital. Yeah. <laughs> Sides, That's right. and one side is consumer. That's right. um, how much action do we need to see on the consumer That's side right. to, to get interested? That's right. um, there's no hard and fast rule uh, uh, enough to get us interested. Um, you know, it's it's it's, it's more more than five and less than five thousand. <laughs> you know, um, I, I really don't know what the number is. It really depends on the nature of your marketplace. Uh, I'll tell you with M. Gotti, um, they were running. I don't know, on the order of uh, 50 transactions per day when we invested in them. Um, that re that's represented the consumer side. They had something like 1,500 drivers that were on their network. So they had quite a bit of traction when we invested. Um, we could have invested in them a little bit earlier um, if, if times had been right. Um, so but that's just a, 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 an example. Um, but we'll look at those on a case-by-case -case basis. If, if we, it also, an entrepreneur has done it before, we're willing to take a higher risk than somebody that's doing it for the first time. Um, we've done that before as well. So it's, re it's really a function of a very, very case-specific. In, in the back. Uh, uh, I am Manoj, uh, a student of social entrepreneurship as well as running a nonprofit. Uh, my question is uh, that when Uh, to, uh, to I'm sorry, I'm having trouble following. Could you stand up and speak a little more loudly? Uh, I'm student of social entrepreneurship as, as well as running a non-profit uh, organization. So, so my question is, uh, suppose you invest in a social enterprise, uh, the value system the founder carries may not uh, uh, line with your value system. You may be expecting the financial return and the guy may be expecting the more social return. So, uh, so how your uh, decision-making uh, role is there? Um, I'm glad you asked this question because it's a very hard area and I'll, I'll just try to repeat it for everybody. What he's saying is how do you get alignment between the social impact spectrum of a business operations from the perspective of both the entrepreneur and the investor? And what happens if they're not aligned correctly? And um, I'd say that this is certainly one of the most important questions that an entrepreneur should have with a prospective investor. Um, so if you look to, at, at us, we are a um, profit first impact investor. So that means that you can talk about social impacts all day long, but you can't show us how you're going to do that on a profitable basis and, re and have a substantial return to investors. We will shake your hand and commend you on the excellent work you're doing, but we won't invest. You'll find other investors who are impact first, and you can talk about profits all day long, but you can't show them how you're going to get every single millimeter of impact that's possible delivered that they won't invest, because they're impact first. And you'll find others that are in between. So I think it's important to go and understand where you are as an, as an entrepreneur, what's important to you, your belief system and your team, and then to find an investor who's calibrated appropriately, and, um, and to have that conversation up front. So if you go to our website, you'll see there's an area called Profits and Values, where it's an area where we try to put forward our philosophy around this concept. Um, it's still fairly high level, and there's really no other way to think about it other than a conversation between an investing principal and an entrepreneur to see what the alignment is around that, that very, very challenging question that you bring up. Yeah. 
can you explain about the forward and uh, backward impact and where United stands in that social impact? Uh, forward and backward, explain. Okay. So that means like uh, you are serving uh, the BOP crowd uh, or you are employing the BOP crowd? Ah. That ah. Okay, so the question is providing, you might also think about this sort of level of impact. Um, a, a soft touch, um, you uh, teach somebody a vocational skill for an hour, um, or a very heavy touch, you give somebody a job for a lifetime, right? And those are both have social impact, and how do we think about it? Um, the answer is we like both. Um, we are comfortable looking at both, and uh, we in fact um, have differing uh, metrics internally with what our expectations are of scale. So a, a lighter impact business, we look for the ability to impact 100,000 families within five years. That's our, our so metric uh, internally relative to deciding is this business in the right uh, scale for us based on our investment pieces to our limited partners. Um, if you're employing people, we look for about 1,000 employees within five years. Not one year, but five years, right? But, so that gives you an idea of, sort of what we expect. It's 100x different in terms of the light touch versus the heavy touch and social impact. In all cases, though, we look for businesses that have the ability to, to scale, um, uh, hopefully without substantial need for capital, as they get rolling. So what is more focusing? It will be 1,000 employees or 100,000 families for you? What is more? Kind of where we focus more. So, uh, well, I, I think I guess we pro probably gravitate more towards the hundred thousand families than the thousand employees, um, just because we know how hard it is to hire a hundred hire a thousand people, um, and um, and we from as scale junkies that we are, um, we like um, to work with entrepreneurs who are also scale junkies. And they tend to be ones that, that are focused on the, on the 100,000 and the 1,000. But again, I, it doesn't mean that we are uninterested in the, in the 1,000. Um, if you've got a plan to employ 1,000 people and do amazing things with them and franchise that out and have that be 10,000 over the following 10 years, you know, we're going to be excited about that too. Yeah. So you spoke about investing in teams, right? How important have uh, you know, a partner when you start off or and you know and do you invest in companies that don't have you know a, 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 a sort of startup partner or co-founder? Yeah so the question is how do we feel about investing in a unitary uh, founder versus a co-founder versus a team? Um, I'd say that our thinking has evolved on that point. Um, when we first started investing we probably looked more at single founders and we now are getting more excited about investing in founding teams. Um, we see that a team that knows how to work together um, and that each bring individual strengths uh, to complement one another uh, is very powerful. Um, because we are not able to do the heavy lifting on you know, building a team or changing a team, uh, like a Series A investor might even replace a CEO and turn them into a CTO and bring a professional manager in and things like that. We, we can't do that, right? So whatever team we invest in is a team that's going to ride, uh, we're going to ride with until they hit Series A. Uh, so we're encouraged to see uh, two and three member founding teams. We have uh, at least one investee that's a four member founding team. We have um, only a couple that are single founding uh, CEOs. We have a bunch of them that have two or three. Uh, so, um, so I think teams are good. Yeah, yeah. I represent a venture room to go, and I'm coming with the beta version of it in the coming month. So I'm just uh, navigating to the website where I found number of low income families who benefit from your business in this site. But my venture is in the urban setup where it comes under your sector of technology. So what I'm looking for is my route to go is all about uh, bringing down the cost of travel by car to it. Where in India we have a intercity uh, you know, travel is cheaper than uh, is costlier than the intra-city travel. So we are coming up with a carpooling search engine, a carpooling uh, app, and along with that a travel buddy program. So combining all these fees, I if I'm you know trying to uh, put in my application, here it will it provides low income impact potential. 
what do I have to write? Because I'm not catering to households, I'm catering to a lot of people. So, right. So yeah, I just sort of Well, people live in households. So, <laughs> so that's I, I, I got that, but uh, as you know, individuals will be taking care of, will be being a part of my car to like, Sure, uh, but I'm just count each one of those is representative of a household, right? Uh, and if there's some duplication, it doesn't matter. I mean, this is a rough guideline. But what, what we're saying there and, and is, look, we, we'd like you to say that you've got a business that can serve over five years um, 100,000 households. And that means 100,000 individuals, in, in, in your case, um, uh, would be uh, possibly uh, impacted by that in the low-income sector. Uh, one of the questions that, that nobody's asked yet, but I'll, I'll answer it because it, it's relevant to your example, is we do not require exclusive impact in low-income sectors. We look for that being about up to half. Um, more is fine, but at least half of what of where your impact is. Um, so if you are 80% in middle and upper income and 20% in low income, that's not a good candidate for us to invest in. There may be a more traditional investor that's better for you. But if you're the other way around, if you're 80% low income, 60% low income, and the balance, middle or high income, that's fine. And the way out of this group, uh, build this application, and if it gets me out, then we'll be on that. You got it. Yeah. And just one more thing, I have one more venture. I'm running it since 10 uh, months. I have a profit of like 35 every up to every month. I'm into hygiene, chemicals for uh, institutions. So I have a team of people from IIT, NID, and a like, co-member team. Now we are planning to set up an R&D lab, proper privilege R&D lab. We're looking in for at least a 50 lakh uh, investment. So will a seed fund like Unitas uh, help out to, with us to an R&D where we will be going green for green chemicals and rural hygiene? So that, that, it's good to actually have some tangible examples here, because you're, you're now forcing me to tell you how I think, um, which is perfectly fair. Um, so the way I would address that, your question is you've got a business that's making money today, you want to set up an R&D hub in order to expand. And, 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 and would we invest in that? And the answer is it depends on where you're going next, right? If what you're going to do is to take those products and then take them out uh, regionally to uh, all, all of uh, all of this state or surrounding states or nationwide and that R&D is going to be the means of enabling that expansion it's going to cre create sustainable differentiation and you have a, a decent plan for how you're going to distribute how you're going to make money as you go national great very interesting um, that but it all comes down to you know what what is your ability to articulate a viable plan for long-term scalable business with impact. Great, thank you. Um, over here. I mean, uh, one part who you talked about was creating 1,000 employees. But I mean, if you look at, I mean, my business is very similar to Caravan. I I work with an ecosystem of artisans. So I have, you have to invest in the ecosystem, not necessarily create them employees, give them capital, or give them training. So is that uh, a valid sort of a way to, you know, uh, move forward in, in your case? Yeah, so the question is when you have to invest in the ecosystem to help the employees be successful uh, or to serve your mission in your company, how do we look at that as an investor? Um, and the answer is with Caravan, uh, we have an investment that we do in parallel with NSTC. And the really interesting thing is NSTC, they're interested in the training side of it. Um, and so NSTC gives us three to one leverage. So for every rupee that we invest, they invest three more rupees of, of long-term uh, uh, discretion. Um, that's the right word. Um, anyhow, low, low cost debt. Um, and so it may, well, one thing to always keep in mind when you talk to a venture capitalist, we're the most expensive money you're gonna raise, right? Because you, can, you go to a, a uh, price insensitive angel, they'll give you a smaller amount of money but at a better valuation. When you go to a series A guy, they're further along, your business is really proven, so you're gonna get a pile of money, um, but at a higher valuation. We're, we're expensive money, so you don't wanna use us for anything that you can avoid, frankly. So if you can get debt to help you do this work, if you can get other means, if you can get NGO non-dilutive funding to help you on the ecosystem side and take our money only where you need it, you're gonna end up owning more of your company and building a more successful business. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my, uh, my name is Manik. So uh, as 
as an entrepreneur with an inclination towards impact first and profits later, and with a significant profit margin capability in my organization, so will raising money from a conventional seed capital firm, or you know, raising money from U.S. seed fund, I mean, how will that be different for me? I mean, is there an edge which Unitas will provide for? Well, if you're you said that you're a in, impact first, profits later entrepreneur. So um, it might require a beer or two for me to get you to think a little bit differently. But what I would encourage is that you will have more impact if you're a profit first entrepreneur with built in impact. That is my philosophy. Our team believes this wholeheartedly. That's not to say if you don't come to believe us, we don't still like you, because I love anybody that's trying to do impact, but my very clear view is that if you can drive a profitable business that has a built-in impact model, that business can then scale without limits, and that impact can then scale without limits. <coughs> if you are an impact business that always requires some extra funding to get across the line, you need some more funding to open up in a new state, and some more funding to open up in a new population, um, you're never going to be able to scale that quickly. And, and so since we're scale junkies and we're all about impact at scale, my encouragement to you would be to say, how do you change your thinking to be a scale business that has built-in impact and profits? And if you have that, then talking to me or somebody like me is going to be a very good conversation, much more so than if you talk to a traditional purely venture investor who's going to basically consider your, your aspirations for impact as a liability rather than as an asset. That's a good thing you touched on. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. Um, can you share some experiences uh, from the companies that you've invested in and among the well-run companies? The areas of deviation between actual expenditure, like for what the funding is being raised, and the Plan yes, the question is, do, do entrepreneurs plan what they spend and spend their plan? Which areas uh, did they, you know, kind of um, in, Interestingly or? enough, I, I, I'd say that, um, that they're pretty good at spending at or below plan because they have no choice. Um, they've only got a certain amount of money, it's got to get them to Series A. Um, the place where I see the biggest mistake, time and time again, is people who presume they're going to get more, more revenue sooner than it actually comes. And all it takes is being off by one quarter when you've got effectively six quarters of cash in the bank. If you're off by one quarter, then you're not going to make it to the finish line of getting your Series A raised. And you're either going to have to cut staff or do a bridge loan or something else extraordinary to get to the point where you can raise Series A. So um, I think that's the biggest mistake we see. And so we really encourage people to be incredibly frugal while their revenue is at the growth stage and to adjust their spending only as they see the revenue start to trickle in and to have, um, if you will, sort of stair-stepped approach. When the revenue gets to X, then I can increase my spending to Y. When the revenue gets to Z, I can increase my spending a little bit further. Um, but if you increase your spending ahead of the curve, which a lot of people say, hey, if I only go and spend a bunch of money on web advertising, I'll have all these customers and I'll be great, well, you'll be broke most likely. Right? So I think that, that's the area where I see the biggest mistake. I think relative to how people manage the expense side, um, it, it varies. Uh, and and I, I'd say there's no common thread that I can think of offhand. Uh, we are a one and a half uh, decade old uh, business, existing business in human resources and uh, have a year on year growth of between say 70% to 100% year on year, barring last three four years. So uh, my question to you is that what would be the criteria for the growth for a company like us, which has its presence, which has its impact, which has grown well, which has its systems in place and which is now waiting for uh, the growth in various parts of the country. So how would you support that uh, this thing as well? Well, as I think for an established business that's a, a services business like what you described, the kinds of things I look at, number one is, well, what is actually the social impact of that business? 
um, from our perspective. And again, you can see our philosophy on that all over our website. Um, if you have, an, uh, if you have a, a, a view on, on what your social impact would be, the next thing I'd say is, um, what is the ultimate scale of that business? Um, how big can it get? And in terms of growth rate, um, growth rates north of 20% are interesting. Growth rates north of 30% are really interesting. And growth, growth rates under 20% are really uninteresting. Um, so I, I'd say, and if you're, if you're more than 30% if you're 40 or 40% growth, you, um, you got a name. Um, the social impact I would call for our kinds of business would be it is impacting households where you are sort of making difference because uh, it may not go to the lower strat of rural side of population of it but then if there is a growth probably you get into smaller cities and are able to uh, look at newer areas uh, in terms of the similar business yeah. but uh, scale it up into other side of the Good. rural well, stream. Well, so, come, come, come uh, so is that these are the only two criteria as of now? So social impact and then the growth. Well, <laughs> and obviously the ultimate business. profitability, right? Again, so are, are you a 20% gross margin business or a 60% gross margin business? Sure. Right? Um, if you're on the 20 side, not so exciting. If you're on the 60 side, really exciting. Right? I'm, I bet you're somewhere in the middle. Sure. Yeah. It looks like we're getting ready to finish up. Is that right? Do I have time for a couple more questions? or Maybe one last question if we have. Very bad. <laughs> what would be your deciding factor whether to exit to another investor, say, a B or five for nine? Ah. Okay. Well, having an exit question as the last question is very appropriate. <laughs> um, first of all, it would not be our decision. Um, by the time we got that far along, um, the decision is going to be made between the entrepreneur and the Series A and B investor, most likely. Uh, we probably have a seat at the table, we have a voice, but it's by no means our decision. Um, if I was advising an entrepreneur, um, I would say uh, you have to look very hard um, at, at the path on an IPO, um, is long and hard. Obviously, the rewards from a liquidity perspective and from a total uh, valuation multiple perspective are very high, um, but the beta factor goes up quite a bit. Um, and so the question you have to ask yourself is, do I want to be on that IPO path and potentially have another two to four years um, to mo both make sure that this company's uh, financials are stable enough to support it and then to get through the lockup period? and um, and whether any potential downturns to be able to have some good liquidity, or do I take um, an opportunity that it's present here, here and now, um, and take a lower percentage uh, or lower return ultimately, but but have it uh, in the hand. Um, probably the hardest decision any entrepreneur ever has to make, but it's a darn good one to have to make. So I look forward to uh, having that conversation with any of my uh, investees um, in the coming years. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Will. Uh, and on this note, I think we should give Will a big round of applause from all of us. Uh, uh, this is what we do as a speaker gift. We contribute to two NGOs, Arpan and Asara, which educate uh, girl children, and the, uh, Arpan is working with sexually abused children. So that's a little contribution on your behalf to Very these nice. uh, two NGOs. Thank you so much for you know what you have uh, you. shared with us today. Uh, please feel free to, pro I don't know how much time you have with yourself right now. You I'll be a little bit, yeah. So Will and his team, we have Eleanor there. Uh